Hi, this is International Master Benny Chang with you once again. <clears throat> and today, <clears throat> sorry, today we are going to go after Max Carlson in in his game against Hikaru Nakamura. Well, um, first thing I'm going to say is that Max Carlson is actually a model, and he's also a grandmaster. So therefore, the title is called a model grandmaster. It's kind of a, uh, it's kind of funny, I guess. But well, it's kind of funny. But okay, whatever. But the thing is, uh, he's actually a model, which I'm actually kind of surprised with because. I'm not quite sure how he became model in the first place. Maybe because he's a very strong chess player. Because I think that's really the only reason why anyone would pick him to be a model. Because okay, I guess he's a uh, it's like okay looking in like the Justin Bieber kind of way. But other than that, I'm not quite sure. This is another picture of him, and yeah, it's, I think it's for G Star Raw. It's a uh, Norwegian I think site. I think I'm not quite sure. What is this? Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I'm not sure, quite sure what G Star Raw does, but anyway, he is a uh, just prodigy, and he's actually the strongest player right now. His rating is 28, 26, yes, and is 15 points higher than the world champion. So yeah, he's a very strong player, and he definitely is probably probably the strongest player in in the world right now. But he's not the world champion for some reason because he chose not to participate in the recent candidates tournament. Which he could have participated and probably qualified for easily, and uh, the reason he did this, he the reason he didn't participate is because it was a knockout tournament. He didn't believe that the tournament strategy was fair because basically what it means is that if you let's say you beat someone and you have to beat them two out three times, and you do that, then you move on to the next round. He didn't think that process was fair because like there's lots of luck involved in just two or three games. It really takes more than just that to figure out who's the better player, right? It takes more like 10, 12, 14 games to really see who's the stronger player because two or three games is a lot of luck. And he chose not to participate. And uh, here is his, his tournament, his his rating system. So at 15 years, he was like 2600. So that's huge because I'm like, I'm, I'm on 2400 right now and I'm like 21. So I'm way off base here. I'm, I'm way too late. Too old for this kind of thing. And uh, he became around 2800. When he was around 18 years and 11 months, almost 19, and yeah, that's, that's pretty impressive. And he became pretty much 2026 20, like he is now at about 20 years and 11 months, which is around 21 years old. So he's about he's he's like pretty much my age, but he's like a way better chess player than I am, than I ever will be anyway. But uh, yeah, let's move on to his game. So let's see here, Carlson Nakamura. Okay. So the funny thing about this is that this is actually backstory with this, in that Gary Kasparov is, well, for a long time, for 20 years or so, he's the strongest player in the entire world. And now he's retired doing politics, that kind of thing. And he was coaching Magnus Carlsen for about two years or so. And uh, this was about a year back. Actually, when they stopped, like, when Gary Kasparov stopped coaching Carlsen, because, well, obviously it takes a lot of money, but also they had their differences in studying and that kind of thing, and apparently they didn't really agree with each other after working together for a while. And so Carlson basically stopped working with Kasparov, and Hikaru took this opportunity, well, I guess recently, I think, to work with Kasparov, and uh, basically both of them are taught by the same guy, well, as of recent times, and they're both very, very strong players. So um, Carlson recently was actually asked, um, like, where does he see Nakamura going, and I'm just paraphrasing very lightly here, so don't quote me on any of this, but I believe that Carlson says something to the likes of Carlson, um, I believe Carlson says something to like that um, Hikaru isn't at the same like strength as some of these other players, like Carlson, Anand, Aronian, Kramnik, these 2800 players, because he doesn't really fully understand chess in the same way that they do. And this is a very, very big diss. So, it's really interesting to see what happened because uh, the funny thing is, I think the last tournament um, they played each other and Carlson won. So Carlson Nakamura probably wants a lot of revenge from that game. So as always, I'm gonna turn on Houdini because it will help us in figuring out who's better and who's worse. So e4 e5. This is a very standard opening. Basic controls the center squares. e4 e5 or d4 d5 are both very popular in mainstream openings. Knight f3, take the pawn. 6, defendant, obviously, c4, so this is a second move, the main move is bishop b5. Bishop c4 is played so that both sides will not 
really understand much theory, and that's one of Carlson's strengths. In that a lot of players nowadays, top, even top players, they memorize a lot of theory because they use computers to analyze games with them, like I'm doing right now. But Carlson apparently is, oh, here we go, decline. But Carlson apparently is very, very strong, and he doesn't actually really need that because he plays a lot of random stuff. And yesterday, actually, he was down two pawns and Luke Michelle, and he managed to draw because he's just, just very strong. He understands chess very deeply, and um, he can pretty much upplay a lot of players in the type of positions that most players would not even dream of playing, and Carson would be fine with it. So that's one of his main strengths. He's adapted. He's very flexible, can adapt to any situation, and uh, he definitely isn't one to be taken, taken lightly, because so far he doesn't really have any weaknesses. I mean, the only, thing, the only problem that he has probably is uh, sometimes he's not able to defeat 26 hard players, 27 hard players. He's not able to outplay them entirely. He just waits for them to make mistakes. And uh, they do make mistakes, as we, we will soon see. So this is a very standard. So so far, Black doesn't want to reveal his hand yet. He doesn't want to castle. So he plays like useful moves like a6, bishop e7, just to wait to see what White would do. So after a few, few more moves, h6. So Black doesn't want to castle yet because uh, well, there's some problems with this. After bishop g5, rook e8, knight 3 should be e6, knight d5. Well, black has to give up his bishop because if he doesn't, let's say he plays something like rook b8. Well, now there's gonna be some slight problems with this, and that's these light scores are very, very weak. His king is also very weak, and um, black is in a whole deep load of trouble because uh, one of the things that black usually goes for is h6. But in this case, after g5. White has a very tempting sacrifice, which I will probably make for sure in g 5 As you can see, this type of sacrifice without the bishop here on e7 is very effective because bishop here doesn't really contribute much. And uh, yeah, who, even Houdini thinks White's winning, even though he's down a piece. So uh, it's definitely not, not, not too good. So that's why Black usually wants to play h6 first before castling. Which is g3, both sides castle. And now bishop e6. h3, just a standard waiting move. And uh, queen e7, bishop e3. There's really not much to say about this. The only thing that black might want to try is bishop 6 h3. But this actually, this move doesn't really work. Because, well, this doesn't quite work. Because there really is nothing for him to do here. After queen 6 h3, knight h2, stops knight g4, and white's fine. But on this next move, there is that possibility of bishop takes h3. But the problem is, it actually doesn't work as well, because uh, after knight g2, knight g4, it looks like there's main 1, right? But rook e1 kind of stops that, and uh, black has to play some moves like knight g6, and if he does, then knight f1 stops mate, and white's up a piece. So this position should be very fine for white. Okay, so... Knight g6, knight f5, and black doesn't want to give up this bishop for this knight because then this bishop would have no counterpart and it would be very strong indeed. Knight e7, take, 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 and now f4. This is a very strong idea. The other move that white could have tried is d4, and this would be fine as well, but uh, really you have to go for a plan, and it's, it's obvious that Manson's plan was basically going on f5 somehow, potentially sacking on f6 as. as we will see. His f4 really allows him to open up this f file and allows his rooks to get into the game. And after a few moves, c5, c2. So black's plan is very simple. It's basically going for a queenside break. Black, white has to try and stop that. Well, not stop that, but delay it for as long as he can. We have 2, take, take, f1. So take, take. And now black is in some trouble because he cannot actually go here because uh, this sacrifice is very strong. And there's something like this. Black is much worse here. I mean, even though it says only plus 0 0.5 or plus 0 0.4, um, white has a very clear plan of this, something like this, and it should be game over. So it's it's, it's fairly awful. Black def definitely doesn't want to get into that kind of a situation, which is why he actually took on f4. So if you take on f4, black doesn't want to get sacked here, so he decides to split h7. After d4, take, take, and queen g5. So now there's a pin here. 
So Black actually can go knight f6, but it's still kind of tricky, as we'll see. He also attacking this knight on g3. So uh, White has to defend this knight first, knight f6, and bishop d1. So this move serves two purposes. First, uh, Black was might, might play rook b e2, basically pinning this bishop against the queen. Also, this bishop allows uh, White to guard the g4 square, and it seems like, why do you need to guard g4, right? There's a pawn here on h3. Well, there's um, going to be some interesting ideas coming up very, very fast. So rook b8, this might have been a mistake. Um, people, were, I think, were actually thinking of something like rook a8. And basically, when he plays h4, queen f5. And uh, there's going to be some problems here, but I will reveal it in a second. So bishop d1, and now after rook b8, this is not quite the same, because after h4, you don't have queen f5 anymore. So you have to go down, and uh, White's move here is very strong here. It's the exchange stack, and this is actually it's probably one of the best exchange stacks I've ever seen, and probably this year. I've seen more impressive ones in the past, but this is the most recent example that I've seen that has worked to such great effect. Because basically what this does is, it forces Black to weaken his king side. Also it gives his knight to h5, f5, bishop h5. Also knight h5, knight knight f6, there you go, and um, white has a huge attack on the king. It might look like there's nothing going on, but in a few moves, it's very clear that white has tremendous compensation, and black really has to play the best moves in order to survive. And it's very difficult for the d defending side to play the best moves when his position is so wrecked like this. So, rook b2. Basically, he's hoping that if he goes knight h5, then, well, this is going to be mate here. So, obviously, White can't go knight h5 yet. So, he decides to play bishop h5 first. This is very strong, actually. Force the queen to g7. And now bishop f3. Now, White wants to play knight h5. The best move for Black here is actually to defend this pawn. It's actually a very deep plan. I'm not quite sure how this works, but Houdini believes that Rudy is the best move. And I do trust it to some extent, because in these tactical, tactical positions, Computers are very strong and adept to figuring out what the best move here is. But uh, he decides to play rook a8. And this is probably a blunder. A lot of the commentators at the time were thinking that this is not a good move. And part of the reason it may be that like, Kimura was actually running low on time. And uh, by move 40, actually how this time control, control works is that you have to make 40 moves in 2 hours. And after the 4th move, you get an hour for 20 moves. So there's so six moves to go, but he only has about five, six minutes left. So really has to just try to play the best moves with not much time left. So it's quite difficult for Black to make the best moves in this these uh, circumstances. But well, he sure has to because if he doesn't, well, Carlson is just gonna destroy him. And this is kind of what he does because after d5, c8, now knight h5, and. Um, this is now going to be very, very explosive. King shades. Now it looks like the best move is e5, right? But if you give it just a few seconds, yes, rook c1 will be the best move. And that will exactly be the move that Carlson plays. He's very accurate in these moves. The reason for rook c1 is you want to have the rook on c7 in some case. Because in the future, maybe something like f5 would come. And then you, if your rook is on c7, you're able to control the h file. And this is actually very, well it's not that that that, that long, but uh, it's definitely like a strong, strong move, because a lot of players they would just play e5. Because they see that, uh, okay so I'll say they play e5. Because they see that after taking this guy, taking this guy, the rook is going to hang. And this is partly one of the reasons why not many players are of Carlson's caliber, because uh, it's a good move, but it's very forcing. and. If you have two moves that you can make, one's forcing, one's not so forcing, you always make the move that's not so forcing for your opponent, because then it gives your opponent more chances to make a mistake. And that's exactly what he does here. He plays rook c1, and after something like king g7, it's actually such a mistake, but uh, really there's not many options for black to, to do here, and uh, king g7 just walks right into what white has in mind here. After e5, now, um, well as you can see the evaluation just skyrocketed there. And he only has rook bb8, which is kind of weird. Like I'm not quite sure how this works. But so yeah, he just took this guy instead. And uh, white could have actually taken on e5 and just won, or gone for this continuation, which also wins. Knight h5 check, bishop king h7, and check here. 
And the reason, actually, well, Black resigned here. And the reason that he resigned is that, let's say he decides to play at 5. Well, here comes Rook C7 with a vengeance. And, uh, after something like King G8, Queen G3 check, King G8, Queen C5, here, and Rook G7, here. Oh, it's actually main in main at 5. Okay, well, it's main at 5, so maybe let's just go back a bit. Okay, so knife 6 check, here, here, and now he's he wants me to just sack here, which is kind of dumb. But yeah, so this is just me in like 2. So that's one continuation if he plays f5. And that's why rook c1 was so powerful. The other line is that if he decides to play king g8, I was queen g3 check, king has to go to h8, and now after going to e5 check, king has to go to g8, we'll play f6. But the problem is the rook is hanging. And as we can see, black is down a piece, this, this, this knight, it's also down a pawn. So this king is also getting attacked, and this is going to be game over in about 5 moves, because uh, Black really has no counter chances, he can check a few times, but honestly, I mean, these checks are going to be useless. Black is just completely lost, and uh, yeah, this is this game is over. So um, at this point, after giving check here, Black resigned, and after reaching move 41, I guess that's why he resigned. He just wanted to reach move 40 to see if uh, his opponent makes him kind of uh, blunder in time, in time pressure. But uh, Carlson didn't. He played very accurately. And the reason for his win is probably going to be Rook 6 F6. This is a very strong move. And uh, I think in the press conference afterwards, Nakamura actually said that he underestimated this exchange sacrifice. Didn't calculate deeply enough. And um, probably didn't really understand how strong it was at the time. I, I uh, completely did not, did not understand at the time as well. I thought, wow, well, Carlson's uh, down in exchange. Well, Nakamura must be okay here. But no, it's uh, not, not so clear. And um, so we see that's why Carlson's so strong. So, uh, yeah, this uh, was definitely an interesting game in the chess sense. And uh, this exchange set definitely will be in my mind for a while. Because it seems like Black was safe with all his pieces in the most active squares, but uh, he still got blown away. So, yeah, that was very impressive. And uh, this is the uh, game for today. I hope you guys enjoyed, enjoyed watching this. And uh, I hopefully I'll be back tomorrow casting game number four with a different uh, person. Thank you very much, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye bye.